All right, everybody, this is the uh, video for car chemistry. Um, this is for November 8th. This is Thursday, and today we're going to talk about the periodic table. Now, we've already used the periodic table for a variety of things. And today we want to talk about why the periodic table looks the way it does and what the periodic ha table has to tell us, because it can tell us way more about our various elements than we've done in class so far. So today we're going to take some notes and then you are going to get a worksheet with instructions on how to diagram your own periodic table. You will also receive a copy of the periodic table that um, we use here in the state of Texas for all of our standardized tasks. So um, <clears throat> first I'm going to start off with a little bit of a history of the periodic table and how it came to be because that will give us a little more of an understanding of um, what it is and what it tells us. So we'll start. Um, the very first idea of the periodic table came from Dmitry Mendeleev um, and you can actually see I posted a, a copy of his original periodic table notes here on the right um, and he discovered that if you list the elements in columns in order of increasing atomic mass, um, he would he found a pattern. Now, he later rearranged um, the columns so that the elements with similar properties were side by side, and he discovered that they remained in order in, of, of increasing atomic mass if you put them in a certain arrangement from left to right. Now, Henry Moseley uh, determined the, the atomic number for atoms of the element, and then instead of arranging them in order of atomic mass, which of course would cause all sorts of problems when you get to isotopes, um, he arranged the elements in order of increasing atomic number. This arrangement gave us what we consider the modern periodic table. And of course, so now we arrange our elements according to the atomic number or the number of protons. And that arrangement shows horizontal rows. We call these rows periods, and there are seven of them total. Um, and the properties within a period change as you move across from element to element, and then the pattern will repeat. For example, there is a pattern between hydrogen and helium, and that pattern repeats with um, lithium and neon, for example. So you see this repeating pattern in each of the periods, and that is one of the reasons that it is structured the way that it is. Now the periodic law says that when elements are, arran are arranged in an order of increasing atomic number, there's a periodic repetition for both chemical and physical properties. And so not only do these elements that are repeated in these columns um, similar in the way they, they look and the way that they um, their physical properties, so the solid at room temperature, um, colorless, odorless, or, or a particular color or luster, but they also react in the same way. So you have the same chemical properties there as well. This is a very important consequence um, that, that leads to a very important consequence that elements with similar physical and chemical properties end up in the same column. And so if you look at the periodic table, each column is going to behave in a similar way. So our vertical columns are called groups or families. So um, our rows across our periods, um, but our columns are up and down. Uh, groups are called groups or families. And each group is identified by a number and a letter. You have two main groups. Uh, we have group A elements and group B elements. Now, uh, group A elements are, exhibit a really wide range of chemical and physical properties, but our group B elements tend to be very similar. Um, those representative elements, those group A elements, we divide those into three broad categories, and I'm going to go over those with you here in a minute. 
So this is the way that it is arranged and you can tell um, I numbered here in blue the 2A, the 1A, 2A, 3A, 4A, 5A, 6A, 7A, 8A. These are all of our representative uh, elements. So they are shown on either side of what I refer to as the pit where you find all of your group B elements. Of course, those being what we generally refer to as our transition metals. So we're going to talk about those B groups um, a little bit later on. But first, we're going to talk about the two or the three major groups that we break our group A elements into. Okay, the first and most obvious of these groups are the metals. These are good conductors of electricity. They have a high luster when clean. This is what helps us recognize a metal when we see it. They're also ductile, which means that you can separate them and they, they will create wires. So if you pull on two pieces or you pull on a piece of copper, for example, or, um, well, any of our, our metals, if you pull on this, it will create a wire in between the two main pieces. They're also malleable, which means that they can be beaten into very thin sheets like foil. Um, so we have two groups of these. We have group 1A and group 2A. These are our alkali metals and our alkaline earth metals. So um, keep that in mind when we get to our activity. We might want to, you might want to rewind to this point so that you can recognize which groups those are um, because you will need to know these groups by name. So if I ask you, for example, where are the alkali metals, you need to be able to identify that that is group 1A and then the alkaline earth metals are group 2A. Okay, and uh, the second major group of our representative elements are the non-metals. These occupy the top right corner of the periodic table. They are not lustrous, meaning they don't have that kind of metallic sheen to them, and they are very poor conductors of electricity. They, they do not um, share their electrons very, very readily. Um, some of these are gases at room temperature. These are include group 7A, these are the halogens, and group 8A. Um, these can also be referred to as group zero. These are the noble gla gases and they undergo very few chemical reactions and so for the most part we don't deal with them all too much in chemistry because they're inert, they don't react with anything. So, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about why that is when we get into our electrons and bonding again. All right, and number three, the third, this third group are the, called the metalloids, and these are the elements that have properties that are like halfway between metals and non-metals. And these are the um, elements that touch that stair step, um, with one exception, and that's the the aluminum, which is a metal, not a metalloid. The heavy stair step line separates these metals from the non-metals, and most of those elements bordering that stair step are referred to as the metalloids, okay? And they have kind of ha um, some properties of each group. Okay. So if we take a look at what we've gone over so far, um, if you'll forgive me, I didn't mean to have a title spray there. Um, over here, one sec. Okay, so if you take a look here, you'll notice that you have the alkali metals being here in group 1A, your alkaline earth metals here in 2A, and all of our transition metals here in the bottom, and our lanthanide and actinide series, those are our inner transition elements, and these would fit here if our periodic table were wide enough for it to fit. Um, of course, our stair step here, dividing our metals and non-metals, and identifying our metalloids, and the noble gases here on the right. So in the periodic table, you notice that group B elements are mostly metals. Um, we refer to these as the transition metals. Um, the inner transition metals, those are lanthanide actinides that get tossed down to the bottom quite often. These are often referred to as the rare earth metals. Um, approximately 80% of all elements are metals, with the exception of mercury, 
all metals are solid at room temperature and that's something that they all have in common.